and I know Peter for a while from Thinkers 50 and I love the work he's doing on innovation, growth, uh, really what we need today. He's very famous in Instituto de Empresa, which is one of the top business schools. So I thought we could have a very good discussion about uh, what's happening today, his views, how can we use some of his uh, concepts to, to develop and, and help ourselves, help organizations. So, uh, Peter, um, do you want to do a small, very small, they have your bios on, and your website, but a small intro, I don't know if you want to share a few slides or just talk us through some of your concepts. I'll make questions and then we open up for everybody to, to discuss too. Okay, I'll spend about um, 10 minutes talking, if that's okay. Yeah. So okay. let me, let me um, introduce myself. And firstly, Antonio, thank you very much for the opportunity. It's great to talk to all of you. Um, I hope something uh, interesting happens in the next 50 minutes. Um, so my life started in, uh, in, in a farmland in north of Northumberland. Um, but then I, um, I discovered the world of science and um, my career actually started in a superconductivity lab in, in Germany and Switzerland, uh, working with CERN. And um, I was working on uh, uh, low temperature superconductivity when you cool things down to minus 270 degrees, then you find out what happens to materials. Um, and this was fascinating, but it was the most boring thing I ever did. So, um, so I decided that my life was not going to be about just pouring liquid nitrogen into a container and watching a printout for a week and then doing the same experiment again, doing the same experiment again. I wanted to do something more human um, and something more creative at the same time. And so uh, I joined an airline in the days when airlines were good. And um, I, um, within five years, I was uh, managing the Concorde brand, if anybody remembers the Concorde brand. And so um, being able to manage a, a product or a brand like Concord was fantastic because um, yes, it was about dreams and it was exciting, but it was also about the customer experience. And so Concord is not a seat, Concord is not a meal, Concord is not a check-in, it's not a product, it's an experience. And so it really taught me to see the world and to see business through the eyes of customers. And, and that's how I started. And then I worked um, for many of the companies. And, um, and then about 15 years ago, I was asked to write my first book. And uh, I was going to write some bullshit called high, high Performance Marketing or something like that, um, which didn't sound very exciting. So the, the, the publisher said to me, write something more interesting um, about yourself. And I thought about this. And one of the big things which I found when I started in business was because I studied science, everybody said, you can do the spreadsheets, you can do the analysis. And I wanted to do the creative stuff. I wanted to, to do the fun stuff with, with people. And so from then on, I always wanted to do a bit of the analysis, a bit of the, the logic, the left brain, but I also wanted to do the more, more intuitive stuff, the right brain stuff at the same time. And that's why my first book was called um, Marketing Genius. And it wasn't a boring textbook, it was saying, how would Einstein, that's the left brain, and Picasso, that's the right brain, a bit of Spanish, um, how would Einstein and Picasso do business in today's world, or particularly do marketing in today's world? And that, was, um, that, that went well, it was translated into 35 languages, and so then I, I wrote Business Genius, and Creative Genius, and Customer Genius, and, um, and that's why my company is called The Genius Works. It's really not, not about some kind of great aspirational thing. It's about how do you combine the left brain and the right brain or the, the, the analytical and the more intuitive approaches um, to being able to look at business. So the hard and the soft, the human and the technology, uh, or however you want to describe it. And for the last 15 years, um, my life has really been um, trying to write books. Um, so each summer I try to write a book and uh, in between, I spend my time traveling, or I used to spend my time traveling around the world talking about it um, in terms of speaking, uh, teaching, and consulting. And so from a teaching perspective, as Antonio said, I work at IE Business School. Um, and then from a consulting, I work with lots of different companies, lots of different sectors. That's the most fun bit because it's real and it's, uh, it's, it's practical problem solving. So right at the moment, for example, I'm working with Adidas in terms of um, helping them to kind of say, how can we um, 
how can we engage new audiences through a more sustainable approach to, 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 to developing their products and also de developing uh, sports experiences for them, for example, in Saudi Arabia. So we're working on that virtually at the moment. Um, in healthcare, I'm working with Abdi Ibrahim in, uh, in, in Turkey about how can you take uh, um, fairly generic medicines to, to new markets in new ways, so particularly looking at services and distribution channels. Um, working with, in, with Microsoft in the States, and for them it's particularly about how do they work better with companies, not just to sell products because they're great salespeople, but how do they help companies to solve problems rather than just buy products. And so how do, you be, how do their salespeople become more consultants, if you like, in terms of doing what they do. And as Antonio said, I also work with Thinkers50, which is a great way of really connecting with what are all the best ideas going on in the world right now. So that's me in five minutes. Um, and uh, what, do I, what do I think of the world right now? Yes. Well, I think we live in a incredible time. Uh, that might not sound a, a, a normal thing which people say, but um, yes, we're going through a lot of turbulence and we're going through a lot of anxiety. Um, it's tough if you're locked down, it's, it's terrible if you've got um, medical issues and so on. So I totally understand that. But at the same time, we live in a time of incredible change. And for me, any form of crisis um, is, a, is, a, is a catalyst of change. It's when things speed up, it's when consumers change their behaviors, and it's the opportunity uh, for businesses to do things in different ways. And I, I am struck by two statistics. One is that if you look at the Fortune 500 uh, today, you'll see 57% of the companies on the Fortune 500 were actually created in a downturn. So you know, downturns are the times when really companies start, companies like Apple, Microsoft, McDonald's, and so on, um, but it's also when they innovate. And if you look through you know, history at all of the economic uh, peaks and troughs, the cycles of economies, when the, when the times are good, innovation is low, but when, when the economies die during recessions, they're the times of peak innovation. And even in the most recent downturn, the 2008 uh, economic crisis, um, of the, of the so-called unicorns, the ones which were certainly uh, previously valued at a billion dollars or more, um, 90 of the 325 unicorns, 90 of them were actually created uh, in 2008 at the, in the midst of the economic crisis, including Airbnb and Uber. So there's something going on about how crisis drives change, but also drives opportunity. And I think partly it's the catalyst to do new things because people change behavior, but also there's an acceleration of trends. And so one of the things I spend a lot of time doing is looking at mega trends and how is the world changing. So for me, there's five big mega trends in the world. So one of them is about the shift to an aging population. One of them is about the shift from the West to the East, or particularly the rise of Asian economies. Third one is really about the shift in technologies to more cognitive uh, technologies or more intelligent technologies. Fourthly is about the uh, shift to urbanization and what that means in terms of how people live together. And finally is the, is the real shift towards uh, grasping the, ch the challenges of um, environmental and social issues in a way which can help companies to grow and to solve many of the problems which planet Earth has at the same time. So combining purpose and profit and being able to innovate in ways which do good as well as make you money. So I think you know, we, we're seeing in many different ways, we can talk about this later, an acceleration of those trends. Um, more specifically, um, the companies I see right now, you know, obviously there's the shift to digital, which is the obvious shift. Um, and we see that in our home working, in our home schooling, our home shopping. Um, which one of those trends will remain and become a permanent feature of life? Well, I think in some ways they will. Um, I was talking to a neuroscientist a few weeks ago, and they were telling me that typically the synapses in the brain um, typically take around 12 weeks to form new connections. And so if you can form new connections between the synapses in the brain, you start to form, more, form, form new normals, new behaviors. And so we've now had at least 12 weeks of um, enforced change to our lives. And some of those behaviors will start to stick, I think. So the question is which ones will and how do com companies and how do different industries respond to that? So obviously we're kind of moving out of survival mode at the moment 
into what will be probably an 18 to 24 month recession. And so how do companies kind of not just keep, keep surviving, but how do they move forward to new ways? And really how do they kind of look to what they're gonna do next in terms of their priorities, if they have to make changes, for example, reduce costs, lay off people, how can they do that from the lens of the future, not the lens of the past? Ooh. So that they're thinking about where they want to get their business to, and then they make decisions based on how they're going to get to that new future, as opposed to surviving by their, their business models and the ways in which they work in the past. And the final thing to say is that um, what I've been doing during lockdown, uh, when I haven't been able to, to travel at all, is I've, I've just finished a new book, which is fantastic because I hate writing books. I've written nine of them, but I hate the process. Um, I enjoy talking about them afterwards and I enjoy the research, but the writing bit is the hard bit. Um, so so my, my, my writing is finished and the new book is called um, Business Recoded. So it's how do you recode your business for a changing world, and particularly the drivers of technology, the drivers of the social and environmental, but also the driver now of a very different environment to which we've seen before. And so what is the new code, if you like, by which business is both outside the way they compete and inside by which the, the way in which they work, they innovate, they get things done. What's the codes of success of the future? So that's what I've just finished writing, and it's particularly about how do leaders step up to have the courage if you like not just you know do their job but have the courage to step up and move their organizations forwards in new and innovative ways so there's my opening thoughts and uh, yeah. I, I i leave it to you to have um thoughts questions and a good conversation now thank you peter i have a couple of questions and then we'll open up let me go just back uh, back up a few years so just a couple of years ago uh, what uh, were you thinking when you were a kid or a high school? What did you want to be at that time? And then you seem to have really reinvented yourself from a career to a, a very different. What, what was a bit the process? What can we learn from that if we are seen in that situation a bit stuck and not happy with what we're doing? Or just two questions to start. Okay, so um, when I was at high school, I was um, an obsessive um, athlete, so a runner. Um, so I was the, the North of England champion for, for 1,500 meters and that kind of stuff. And, and I wasn't really caring about the future. I was, I was enjoying my life. And I always, tell, I always tell my children, you know, don't worry too much about the future and what you're studying and all the rest of it. Yeah, you should study, but, but enjoy your life too. So do what you do, swimming, ballet. I've got two daughters and, and whatever. So... So I was enjoying life and I was getting the most out of running. So my dream to answer your question was to be an, an Olympic athlete um, mm -hmm. at that time. But my body was never going to be an Olympic athlete, so I had to have a, a plan B. And so, um, so I decided to go to university. And when I went to university, I chose to do a combination of physics, but also European studies. Um, because it kind of kept my options open. It meant that I got four years and a trip to Germany for a year. And um, it gave me some new things. And physics was perhaps the least helpful thing for my future career. But the other things I did at university, um, traveling around Europe, spending time living in Europe, um, running sports clubs and promoting them and so on, that's where the marketing came from, and being able to organize events. Um, that's what I did at university, which was not part of my degree formally, but it's what um, helped me most with my career and finding out what actually I, I wanted to do. And then, um, then I made the leap to, um, to, 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 to business because, you know, I found that the scientific process was interesting, intriguing, but it was a very slow process. And I wanted, I wanted to do something which was really kind of making things happen with people. And so it wasn't the profit motive, but it was the making things happen motive, uh, which was most important to me. And uh, following that, Peter, uh, going back now to what the work you do, how do you help organizations? If you can share a little bit of an example uh, to understand the process and, 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 and the te technique that you use or just to get more concrete on, on one example. Okay, so, um, so you know, I, I, I spent um, my early career in... Well, firstly in marketing and sales, and then in terms of strategy, 
um, with different organizations and I worked in a consulting firm which is where you can learn huge numbers of tools and work with many companies very quickly so it's a great kind of way of learning practical um, uh, strategy and support um, and what I found um, working much more individually with companies is that um, it's easier to have a kind of a, a template process by which you do things and so what I do these days is I typically work with leadership teams um, so I give you an example. I, I just finished in, in March, uh, February, uh, sorry, January, February, March this year, a project in Turkey with um, a fashion company. And we had the board of the, or the executive team and the owners of the, of the, of the, uh, of the fashion company. And it's a family owned business. They never really um, had a proper strategy discussion before between the family and the executive members. And uh, they realized that uh, their profits and their revenues were both going down because of the trend in terms of uh, the high streets, in terms of people buying online, and the falling prices of their products. <coughs> and so, um, so the challenge was, where do we go? What do we do? And really, I worked in three parts with them. So we had a two-day workshop which explored the future. What is your dream? What do you want to do as an organization? Where would you love to go? What are the priorities? And also what are the problems for your business? So it was really about kind of exploring. Mm -hmm. And within that exploring, we also looked at, well, what do other companies do in the similar sector to yours, in other parts of the world? So what ideas can we get? Then we had a break where they thought about it and then we came together for another two days, the executive team. And this is when we started to develop potential solutions. So what strategy would you like to have? So we started off from the future. You know, what would you like to be in five years time, 2025? So we started off by developing a series of scenarios for 2025. And then we worked on, well, what is the common thing between them? And not me telling them, but they deciding themselves what is the most important thing. So what I realized as a consultant is that it's not what I tell them, it's what they decide themselves which matters. You know, I've watched so many big consulting firms in the past hand over the, the reports and then nobody does anything about it. So it's really about getting the executive team themselves to make decisions and to think about things. So the second workshop two days is really about thinking about the options for the future. And then at the end of that process, I start to say, well, if this is what you want to achieve in five years, what will it look like in three years? And then what will it look like in one year? So it's a future back process. And so in the third workshop, after a break, so the third times two days, um, it's really about developing what is your forwards looking um, strategy. So if this is your five year, three year, one year perspective in terms of your dream, what do you need to start doing? Um, what are the priorities for next year compared to three years, compared to five years? And, and I know as project managers, then you're familiar with working from the, the end backwards. That's the way you always work. But it's amazing how many people in terms of developing business strategy never do that. They start with what do we want to do next year, then they would go to three years, then they go to five years. And the problem is that they always kind of keep stretching the old world. They keep stretching what they have now and they try to make it a little bit better or a little bit cheaper or a little bit faster. And they never kind of break with the old world. And I think you know, too many companies have, um, have the, the problem that they keep trying to stretch the old world a little bit further, the old way of doing things, their old success model. And they don't kind of jump to the future, say, where do we really want to be in a kind of discontinuous way and then work backwards. And then suddenly they realize next year, if they work backwards, next year will be completely different if they just try to add five or ten percent to it. So you know that's that's typically the way of working. It's three times um, two days. It's an opening up. It's a making kind of options, and then it's a closing down process with the top team, typically around strategy and strategic innovation initiatives. And the outcome is typically a five-year kind of. Um, a blueprint, I wouldn't call it a strategy document, a blueprint, which has a portfolio of options, which they will um, explore, short, medium term options, which then explore during that period of time, both in terms of uh, innovations, products and services they develop, but also how they will develop their business and adjust their business models over time. 
very, I, I like very structured. So it's like really a process that you can apply to any type of business when they're thinking about their strategy. So Peter, yeah. I have a macro question before, I think most of them will be more detailed, but it, so it's going back a bit more to the higher level. When you talk about these five big trends, then you like to study that. I don't know what you think, which I think makes the current crisis very different than in the past, is that the current political environment and the leaderships in politics um, is very different than in the past. It's very destructive. It's very egocentric. It's not, you know, we had the Second World War and people wanted to rebuild together, creating the nation, United Nations. And, but you yeah. don't see that doubt. I don't see it coming. So how is that? more political, which has so much influence, going to affect this? Um, ju just your thought, maybe it's not something that, just what you okay. think. <laughs> Thank you for that one, Antonio. Um, so I think, um, I think you know, if we, if we look from the positive side, then in terms of um, political leaders or national leaders, we see kind of extremes. Um, so we see some very good ones, and obviously um, Jacinda Ardern from New Zealand, or yeah. you take somebody like um, uh, Meta Frederiksen from Denmark, um, or even the, the um, Taiwan leader, who's also a female. Um, her name is Tsai yeah. ing -wen. Um All three of them, three female prime ministers, have been incredibly... Um, positive with their people um, and they've done two things they've really shown a lot of empathy yeah. and they've shown a lot of you know togetherness um how we can do things together if you listen to their language and they've been very decisive you know they were quick to lock down their companies they were quick to kind of uh, decide what they had to do and what not to do um and so they were they were strong but they were also very empathetic uh, at the same time and and then we've got the other kinds of leaders, and I don't even need to mention them, most of them are men, and, um, and they were indecisive, and they were not empathetic, and they were all about themselves, and they were kind of you know, defensive more, more, more often than kind of empathetic in terms of what they were doing. So I think there's, there's quite a contrast in terms of how political leaders have responded. But I think also there's a big shift since, um, since the end of the Second World War when the United Nations and so on came together. Um, I was doing a big event um, in London just um, the week before everything was locked down. And it was, um, and it was really um, with Ban Ki-moon and it was talking about the future of the nation states. And the big thing which we were discussing was how the power of nations is in decline. And so in many ways, the kind of the hierarchies by which nations are formed, people's respect for those hierarchies, the ways economies and so on work within those hierarchies is really being um, challenged by a much more linear or, or sorry, horizontal way of working, which is much more networked, um, crosses boundaries in different ways from a, from a human or a kind of a, 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 an individual level. It's about social media and how tribes of people connect together. Um, and from a business point of view, it's about global supply chains, but perhaps more importantly than that, global ecosystems. And so I think it's these more connected network-based um, uh, horizontal ways of uh, thinking which will be more important in the future, and they are actually more resilient um, than the traditional hierarchical uh, nation-driven ways of thinking of the past. Very nice. Thank you. A very positive way to look at uh, okay. something that doesn't I look <laughs> something that doesn't look very good. But thank you for yeah. It, I think spot on. Let me move to a few questions from our friends here. Glenn, please can you um, pose your question to Peter and. Just try to keep it short and to the question. Okay. Then tell us where it's you a, are so that we know. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm in San Diego, California. Um, it's actually cloudy today, <laughs> unusual, but um, hello, everybody. Um, I just, my question was simple is uh, how much of your book and the writing that you did for this new book was done during the epidemic? Like all of it or part of it? And how did it influence the? The, you know, with the content. And then how, when, when can we get a copy and where? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, so um, 
I guess um, I, I started writing in January and uh, I'd finished by, um, well, um, about two weeks ago. So probably it's probably half and half to, to, be, uh, to be absolutely honest in terms of half of it was written before lockdown and then half of it was ri written when we suddenly realized that we were in a serious situation. Um, and how much did it change? Um, now I could lie and I could say it cha everything changed and I wasn't going to change anything. But um, what I think was interesting was that the book I was writing was all about saying how you know, we're in this time of incredible change as it is because of the, the, the enormous uh, uh, impact of all of these new technologies. Um, we're in this time where there's an, inc there's an increasing fracturing between society and business. So if you look at the Edelman Trust Barometer, the trust in business, for example, is at an all-time low. Um, but also in terms of the ways in which we behave, and you see lots of businesses increasingly becoming consumer-centric in, in a complete way, consumer-to-consumer -consumer businesses, you know, their communities and so on. So they almost don't need businesses in the traditional way. So I think that's changing. Um, you see um, the Generation Z and Millennials, um, so the latest two kind of uh, generations of talent, um, really rejecting a lot of the corporate um, environment. So they prefer to work for startups, they prefer to work for nonprofits, and so they don't want to work in those ways. And over the last 18 months, we've seen this huge thing um, from the Business Roundtable and then from the World Economic Forum, which was, um, as Klaus Schwab called it, the death of capitalism. Um, so the rejection of the short-term, short shareholder value-driven um, thinking into a much more of a stakeholding approach. And if you take those four things, they were already kind of, when they come together, a, a, a huge crunch point for business to need to rethink itself. And then on top of that, we had this kind of acceleration of the crunch point, which was the, the shit moment when we thought, well, we have to change because our businesses are gonna go bust otherwise. And so to be really honest, I think the crunch was coming, or the crunch is there, um, but suddenly we, we realized that we, we have to change, it's not that we want to change. So, so if, if we were going as a team, we're trying to um, help businesses survive, would it be better to focus on the business and what they're doing or to focus on finding a way to get people employed? Uh, so the, <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a chicken, there's a chicken and an egg in there, isn't there? Yeah, there is. <laughs> exactly. So and we're at that point right now. We're trying to decide. Yeah, so you can't employ people unless you have a business to run. So um, so so we need businesses to employ people, um, and you know that that's part of the challenge is that um, we need to have sustainable businesses for the future, which will employ people into the future. And so if we've, all, if, we, if, if we've only got businesses which are essentially declining because they're not really solving the fundamental issues which, they're, which they should be solving, then, then, then they're, they're leading towards a slow death anyway. And so that would be a miserable future for employees. Um, if you look at um, robotics and AI at the moment, you know, we've got the prediction which comes from MIT that by 2025, that um, I think it's... 30% of 70% of our jobs will be affected by, by robotics. But what, what they also say is that more jobs will be created through robotics than are lost by robotics, but they will be different, which brings us to a reskilling challenge and, 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 and people are stepping up in new ways. So we, we realize that as kind of automation in all its different forms, um, starts to take many of the process-based jobs which we've had in the past, people will have to step up to do more human-based jobs, which is not just kind of just finding employment for them, it's actually adding value. Mm. And so it's adding more emotional, intellectual, um, va and, and collaborative value to them than existed before. And so we can do things which we couldn't do before, and we have more opportunity to do things than we had, couldn't do before. And if we get the economy to work in the right way, then people will pay for that additional uh, value, which is created for those more emotional, more thoughtful, more human things. And as a result of it, people will then, businesses will make the money to pay people. What they have to do is they have to learn to share that money in a, in a more open stakeholder driven way 
as opposed to just an obsession with giving it all back to, to their in, to their investors. So, you know, I, I, I think, you know, the, 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 the answer to your question is we have to create the companies of the future to find the jobs of the future. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. We have, a, and, and Glenn, there's lots of questions, Peter. You're trigger many here. Ricardo from Madrid, I think. Ricardo Sastre, more about the IE, your relationship with that. Ricardo, can you, you're calling from Madrid, right? And then, Leslie, I'll, I'll pass you on the mic. Yeah. Yeah, hello Antonio, hello Peter. Yeah, I'm from Madrid, okay. Spain. I'm an alumni from Instituto Empresa. Uh, I was wondering because when I took my full MBA program, I did not have any innovation subjects. Uh, it was many years ago. Uh, I was checking out the, the website in Instituto Empresa and I see that uh, they are linking innovation in a program with marketing and sales. So I was wondering if the focus in Instituto Empresa regarding innovation is more linked to marketing than, for example, to a strategy or leadership. Okay, um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the particular program. So what I do at, at um, IE Business School or Institute Impressa is that um, I lead their, their senior executive programs. Um, and so the, the top one is called a Global Advanced Management Program. And I'm delighted that Antonio is joining us this year to be part of the faculty. Um, and that's a, a four week program which kind of is about leadership. Um, but it's really about leadership in the, in the new world. So it's about exploring the future, exploring how to drive innovation, how, exploring how to, to lead, pro, to lead a, an organization which is based on projects as well as people and that kind of stuff. Um, and IE's approach to innovation is quite interesting is, and it's the reason why I chose to work with them. Um, so most people will think of innovation as, as products and innovation as products driven by technology. And IE's perspective has always been about humanities. And so it's really about bringing humanities and technology together, uh, which, is, which is important. So from a business point of view, bringing humanities and technology together means bringing consumers and technology together, which is the sales and the marketing part, the consumer part, together with the technology. So there's no point in creating products or services which, which consumers don't want. And actually part of the innovation today is how you connect consumers and businesses together. So new relationships, new business models and so on. And so it requires you to innovate the way you sell and the way you market as much as to innovate the product or the service which you have. Um, and, and I guess that's why you'd see that connection there. Um, but there's a, there's a number of different programs and uh, I've just launched a new one, which is an online program called Slingshot. Uh, which is for up and coming leaders, um, which is a five day intensive online program, which is about, uh, I don't know if it's back to the physics actually, this is physics. Um, it's slingshot is when you kind of, uh, you, you sling a satellite around a planet in order to accelerate it through speed. So you use the gravitational fee field in order to accelerate the body. So how can we use the, 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 the gravitation of a crisis in order to accelerate our business and to accelerate the talent development of our people. So that's what the Slingshot program is over five days. But, um, but Ricardo, um, send me an email afterwards and we can talk about the various different programs if you'd like to, or we can have a call afterwards and uh, talk about what's right for you. Thank you. Leslie, where are you calling from? Can you come with your emails? and put the question to Peter. While Leslie's coming, Peter has one of the best, I think, newsletters I've seen. It's really not one page, it's a few pages, but really very, very good read, very good read. So I will, if that's okay, Peter, share that with all the, the 400 people of the group and, and maybe connect because it's really worth reading that. Leslie, are you there? I certainly am. Um, oh, okay, finally, Go ahead. I know, unmuted myself. I'm calling from Bangor, Maine, which is near Acadia National Park. So beautiful part of the world. Uh -huh. And um, I'm looking at this, I think, from a, a broader perspective and trying to make sense of it, not only for myself, my business, my clients, but I've been kind of doing an informal poll. And what I'm finding is I think people feel like they've been now foisted into this very much virtual world, uh, both working and living. And um, what I'm finding is a certain level of weariness and stress, and it could be that this change is being accentuated by isolation. 
um, but they are feeling this pressure to accommodate it and maybe adapt to it. So I'm just kind of curious, um, what are your thoughts on this pressure to accommodate digital and virtual and yet our very real need to have direct human contact? I, I don't know about you, but I'm certainly feeling some stress that I can't touch anybody any, anymore and it's driving me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, the best, the best, uh, the best thing I, I found, uh, Leslie, is that uh, every morning. I, I don't know what the situation is for you, but in, in where I am in the UK, um, we're allowed to go and uh, go for walk or go for run. So I start every day with a run. Um, so I, you know, self isolated, but um, I go for a run. I, I run for uh, ten kilometres. Um, if I don't do that, I feel I've achieved nothing during the day. But I also feel um, kind of quite exhilarated when I've done it. Um, and what I always do when I run is I always uh, work at a threshold level, which is something I learned from athletes many years ago. And the threshold level is uh, when you get to the level where you're almost exhausted but not completely exhausted. And what that means is that you feel as though you've had a very good workout, but when you come back, you're not completely tired, and so you feel ready to work. Um, and so, so that's, 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 that's what I personally do. Um, I also, um, I never work for more than two hours, which is um, quite hard when you're writing a book because you're kind of up against the time scale and all the rest of it. Um, but two hours and then I do something different, such as uh, 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 have a call with somebody or, 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 or make something to eat or whatever it might be. Um, so always working for two hours. And I try to, to, to create uh, as many social calls as well as business calls. And so kind of, you know, the, the, the more social calls to keep kind of real life going at the same time. But we're all living in this strange world. I mean, I was, I was reading in a newspaper just this morning, um, uh, online newspaper, because I'm not buying real newspapers. Um, but, um, and, uh, and it was saying how so many people are having weird dreams at the moment. And the weird dreams are, are, are coming because we don't have the amount of uh, normal stimuli which we'd have in, in, in a normal day when we're traveling and when we're sitting in cafes and we're meeting lots of people. And the reason is because we're not having as much change in our day, as many different experiences, mm -hmm. multi-sensory experiences as we, as we normally do have. And so therefore, m most of us have strange dreams about stuff which is in our past. And we also sleep less well um, as a result. So it's a, it's a weird, strange time. And, you know, uh, there's, there's lots of psychological techniques for doing things, but you know, I, I've told you the ones I try to use. <laughs> I just had a, a, just kind of a quick follow up. Like I said, there's, I think there's a feeling for people that they must conform to this new way of doing business, whether it necessarily makes sense for their business or not. Um, how as people in a consulting role can help them sort out because virtual is a tool like anything else that needs to be used appropriately. Yeah, um, so interesting. Uh, I, I don't have the answer again, um, but I think some, some of this conformity is quite interesting. Good, it's a really interesting point. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and it goes back to the old, the old mindset where we worked in organizations, where we kind of conformed to organizations, um, where we worked in certain places, our desk in the office and you know, our place at the table and that kind of stuff. We had certain uh, structures and uh, uh, patterns which we followed every day, which was good. Um, you know, for example, getting dressed to go to work was good because it would signal the change in our lives. And now we don't have that. Um, but if you look at young people who prefer to work in a gig economy rather than work working in a corporate economy, you know, they are kind of, even before any of this happened, they were choosing to, to not uh, become employed in a corporate environment and to conform to those old ways of, of, of thinking, which, which, which we have. And so, you know, maybe it's actually challenging us to think in a different way about what is conformity and so on. Mm -hmm. I certainly think we will, we will move to a more distributed work style. Um, and our, our distributed work style will be, uh, you know, obviously much more flexible. Um, it'll be much more spread out. And so we'll work from home more. We'll work from different locations. And so we don't have to have head offices in the old way. I'm not even sure the concept of the office has to exist. I mean, the office is a really strange term when you think about it. Why do we go to these offices, these places, <laughs> just to do work? I mean, 
when we when we get to, when we get to another 50 years time we'll look back and think the office was a really weird concept and so you know i think that will change and i also think that many more people will not be employed by organizations they'll work more flexibly in a freelance way for multiple organizations on many different projects at different times thank you pleasure sorry james brian and arton where are you in, uh, first James, where are you and what's the question? James, are you there? I've mastered the technology, which is always good. Um, I'm in London, um, so hi from London. Um, I'd like to know uh, what you think the biggest learning from the pandemic is, or you can have a few if you like, Peter, um, that we'll lose on the way out of it. Mm. <laughs> you added that bit in at the end. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think the biggest learning, um, I'm going to answer the question I thought you were going to ask first of all. <laughs> um, the biggest learning from the pandemic, I think, is the role of humanity. Um, and one of the things I've talked to, you know, I'm, I'm passionate about is, is how innovation or particularly ingenuity uh, is about human and technology together. And it's about how do we kind of, uh, how do we innovate humanity and how do we innovate technology together at the same time, which is particularly important. And I think, um, you know, understanding the ways in which people work together with technology uh, is incredibly important. I think we're, we're in an experiment right now, a big live experiment, uh, which is exploring how people are, 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 are working with technology and how technology should serve people, not people serve technology. So, you know, that, that you know, not to be a slave to the technology. And, and particularly as we move into more advanced kind of uh, augmented reality, artificial intelligence and all that kind of stuff, I think we're really going to have to uh, think much harder. You know, Elon Musk always warns about this. Um, despite all his madness and all, all the rest of it, one of the biggest things he actually spends a lot of time in is, is an institute called OpenAI. And at OpenAI, they really think about the ethics of AI. So what are what is the responsibilities which they have? Satya Nadella at Microsoft too. Um, and so understanding the ethics and the roles and the kind of the, the, the ways in which humans can, can work and be supported by, by, by technology and do more from technology will be incredibly important. And then an extension of that is obviously the, the, the impact on social and environmental things, which, we, which will also be there. So to answer your question, <laughs> will, that, will, that, will that stay afterwards? then um, I, th I think there's a good chance it will, to be honest. I think a good chance it will. I think the thing which will not stay is that I think too many people will try to find their ways back to those strange places called offices. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, James. Thank you, Peter. There's a question from Arton. Arton, where are you calling from? Hey, Antonio, I'm calling from Cary, North Carolina, USA. Hey. Right. Yeah. My question to Peter has to do with, uh, can you summarize the process of uh, balance the right uh, left brain uh, to innovate, uh, make decisions? Uh, I was intrigued. Uh, I think all of us trying to do that, but do you have a kind of a process or something? Okay. In so, um, so let me first of all say that any new any neuroscientists in the room will tell you that firstly the brain is much more complicated than left and right brain so i think we all understand that um left and right brain is a very simple way of describing a model an analogy for, for for thinking so 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 let me say that first of all um but i think what's what's interesting with left and right brain is that um it is true and neuroscientists will back it up um, that, uh, that they're very different ways of thinking. So, um, so a logical way of thinking is very much a, about closing down. It's a deductive. And so it's about kind of trying to solve the problem um, in a closing down way. And the right brain intuitive is much more opening up. And so it's about, uh, it's about uh, looking uh, for, 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 for other opportunities. 
So one of the big challenges in terms of any form of um, solving a problem is that it's better to open up before you close down. Because if you close down too quickly, so whether, it's a, whether you're trying to solve a problem which leads to an innovation in a company, or whether you're just trying to solve a problem in terms of, I don't know, which you, you have at home or your kids, you know, being able to actually understand what the problem is, is the first part of it. And most of us too quickly jump to the wrong conclusion. We, we try to solve the wrong problem. So being able to explore the problem by using your right brain, which means you using your intuitive way of thinking, uh, is much more important before then you start to close down with, with your left brain, if you follow the analogy. So how do, you, how do you use your right brain? Well, that's about using additional stimuli. So, you know, for example, one of the big things which I would do would be able to um, generate a lot of ideas as to what the problem might be incredibly quickly. One of the best ways to do that is to follow what um, um, Hal Gregerson talks about at, at MIT. And he's all about saying, it's not about having the answers, it's about having the questions. So being able to ask the right questions. So being able to ask lots of questions. And he has, as opposed to brainstorming ideas, he has what's called question burst, which is a brainstorming questions. And so what you do is you, you, you generate as many questions as possible before you start to look for answers. And so the, the questions, there's no logic to it. It's about much more random process uh, using your right brain in terms of exploring what the questions could be. And then you group together those different questions and then you look at kind of the, the, the breadth of them and the themes emerging through them. And then you start to, to, to close down in terms of looking for what the, the actual solution or the, the problem might be, which you're trying to solve. And then you have this second opening that you to solve that problem and then close down to solve that problem again. Maybe I'm not describing it clearly enough. I need a diagram, but, um, but this idea of opening up closing down, opening up, closing down. The opening up parts where you're diverging is much more intuitive. The closing down parts where you're converging are much more um, logical. So using that kind of alternation between the two sides, I think is, is really important. Thank you, Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Let me, I need to be a bit selective on the questions, otherwise we'll stay here forever. We can keep going. <laughs> now, I'd like to finish on time. Let me just pick up a bit different uh, questions that uh, I see. One on the strategic planning, there's comments about scenario thinking and strategic uh, planning, which I think is a bit what you're talking in your first uh, workshop. But let me go to, 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 to who I see. Mark, you're talking Pranksky, you're talking about kids. So I wanted to go back to a topic which is a bit close to us. Uh, Mark Krinsky. Yeah. Hi, can, it, can you hear me? Yes, Mark, hi. Uh, um, hi, this is terrific. I hope we connect after this because uh, I got a couple of things, uh, many things I wanna talk with you about. But the, my question specifically, when you said this idea of stretching into the future incrementally, that's really what education has been doing. There is no break in education that I can see to something new. And, and so I would really, that's what I look for and that's what I'm exploring. I think it happens around projects, which is why I'm connected with Antonio in this group. And so I'm interested in, in understanding where you think, how, how kids, like you say, companies should break from the past, how yeah. kids can break from the past, not adults who are already doing education because they're not breaking, they're incrementalizing. But how can kids themselves organize to go in new directions that will help them? Um, and I say kids, I mean, I mean zero to 20, right, roughly. Um, what can they do in your view that will help move the world in better directions? I think the biggest way is to do exactly what we talked about beforehand is to imagine, imagine the future they want to create. And so, you know, rather than trying to live by the rules and follow the rules, then to jump to the futures they would like to create. So um, I think that becomes incredibly important. Um, 
And so, you know, how do you do that? Um, one of the really simple techniques which I use, which many of you will be familiar with, is, is moonshot thinking, which comes from Google X's lab, um, uh, which is all about, you know, thinking 10x, not 10%. Um, and they have, you know, I, I went to Google X many years ago, and Astro Teller, the first thing he showed me was the big um, sign on the side of the wall, and it said, um, why, why do we try to find 10% improvement when we could go for 10 times? And his argument is finding 10 times improvement in anything um, doesn't require 10 times more effort. It maybe requires two or three times more effort, but doesn't require 10 times more effort. So by being able to jump to 10 times of whatever the problem is, so be able to maybe make a car go 10 times faster, not just 10% faster, or whatever you dream of as a kid, you know, when you're doing your school projects, Dream of thinking, you know, what if it was 10 times by which we could do this thing? And then what are the crazy, amazing ways which we could solve that 10 times problem? And then you immediately break from the traditional ways of solving the problem, the incremental ways of solving the problem. So I think that's really important. Um, I would recommend a, a really good book to you uh, for kids, uh, which is by Matthew Syed. Uh, Matthew Syed uh, was an Olympic um, sportsman, and he's Matthew. now a... Um, a business writer uh, for the Guardian newspaper in the UK. And um, Matthew Syed has this uh, book called Moonshot for Kids. Uh, so it's all about getting a growth mindset. You're probably familiar with the growth mindset or Carol Dweck. Um, this, this more growth mindset thinking into children and the way in which they're taught at schools. Thank, thank you. Many are doing this. How do we get the kids to have a voice in, in, in the adult world. That, uh, I think that the, the answers are here, which mm -hmm. you've just suggested, and people are thinking about this all over. Can you think of a way to get kids more, uh, a bigger voice, say, in business, which is where you work, so that some of these moonshot ideas come into business and not just in, in Google? Well, I mean, what, one, of, one of the very practical ways is, uh, you know, my children's school, they have a TEDx event. And so, you know, in the TEDx events, the kids do their own events in exactly the same format, and it's put onto the TED website in exactly the same way, so it's available to anybody. Um, but one of the things that you could do is you could, in the same way as companies um, work in kind of corporate venturing uh, with startups, why don't companies work in corporate venturing with schools? Um, so, you know, you're, you're utilizing the, 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 the mindset, the creativity of children, um, but you're also giving something back in terms of exposing children to the world of business. Um, the biggest reason, in my experience, why, why most companies do corporate venturing is because they want to develop the creative entrepreneurial kind of mindsets into their stuffy corporate organizations. And so you could equally get that. By, by working with, with, with kids. So, you know, maybe call it kids venturing as opposed to corporate venturing. Great. Right. I'm, I'm not going to take up more time. We can build schools in corporations, inside exactly. corporations, which, which would be a lovely thing to do. I want to talk to you separately about symbiosis. Okay. Okay. Later. Email me. Bye-bye. I will. Give me your email. Thanks. I'll get you, if that's okay, Peter, I'll share your email. I, I share also the where they can sign up for your really, really great newsletter. I think there's few good, good, great newsletter like Peter. I like Rita McGrath as well. Always great, not too often, but I'm always looking forward to read you. I do want to finish on time, Peter. I know everybody's busy. There's a few questions much uh, more here, Peter. I, I was wondering if you could, I can send them to you, maybe do a quick uh, recording or I, I like to, people have took the time to put their questions, so maybe we can group them, but I, I, I don't like to leave some questions here, but otherwise, Absolutely. yeah, you don't mind, Peter? I do. No, I'm, I, I will definitely do that, and um, everybody can email me. My email is really simple. It's peterfisk at peterfisk.com. Um, my, my website is thegeniusworks.com. Um, and if you type in peterfist.com, you'll get to the same place by magic. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and yeah, so, um, so I think, uh, you know, it's, um, it's great to, to meet you all. Um, I'm very, very happy to contribute today. I, um, I hope we can continue the conversation in many different ways. I think, you know, to, to repeat as I started, we live in an incredible time. It's scary. 
it's uncertain um, and sometimes it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not very nice. Um, but it's also incredible in terms of the opportunities which are emerging from that. And you know, the challenge for all of us is to step up to say, what are those opportunities and how can I start right now to, um, to seize them? Can I ask you one closing question, Peter? We, many of us have been working in projects, project management. How should we evolve? Uh, you probably are in contact. We're seeing like discipline and structure and the old. What, what would be like the, the good evolution for us? And, and you asked me to be part of your program. So you do see value in what we bring, but what would be the twist or what we need to do differently to be more successful that not half of the projects fail or just to close up with that, which I think is close to many of us. Um, I think, I think what's interesting, um, and I'm going to actually take a quote from you, Antonio, and see if I get it right. Um, about two years ago, we were um, in the Danish city of Odense, and you stood on the stage, Antonio, and you said, um, it used to be that 80% of people had line roles and 20% job, job uh, projects. Now they have 20% job roles and 80% projects or, or something like something that. Something like that, yeah. I think, um, I think the reality is that projects are always seen about implementation and implementation is incredibly important. Um, so implementation, making things happen. And if you look at, you know, all the stuff which Brightline and others have done in terms of trying to you know, make strategies happen, implementation is incredibly important. But actually, um, the sexy stuff is when you're kind of part of the strategy and you're part of the growth and you're part of looking at where is the business going into the future. And that's where I'd like to see project managers. So I don't want project managers to be seen as the, the oily implementers. <laughs> I yeah. want project managers to be seen as the sexy strategists. I want strategy to be redefined as a portfolio of projects which will take the organization into the future. I want value and when you talk to your investment analysts and people like that i want you to talk about what are the projects you're making happen for the future and how they will deliver future profits um, i don't want to know the costs i want to know the the the, the positive impacts of this and i and, and i i learned that from the world of marketing a long time ago uh, with coca-cola and i was working with coca-cola in atlanta and i was developing the marketing strategy for them worldwide and we, the marketing director took it to the CEO and the CEO immediately went to the budget, to the costs. And the marketing strategy was seen as a cost and it got cut. And then we went back a bit later and we, we, we kind of reframed it. We called it a growth strategy, not a marketing strategy. And by calling it a growth strategy, they didn't cut anything because they said, we need this, we need every bit of it. And the more of it, the better. So, you know, for the marketers, they repositioned them as the growth drivers of the business. And I think for the, the project managers, being able to see yourselves as the architects of the future, not just as the implementers of today, is, is incredibly powerful. Because you are the people who have the, the projects, the tools, the pathways, which will take the organization forward to new places. And that's incredibly important. But it's incredibly powerful too. Thank you, Peter. And we didn't script that, uh, but it sounds really good. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Peter. I'll Thank send you. you the questions for so that we can get answers, but really extraordinary session on the future. And I loved it. Thank you, all. Peter. We'll see you soon for sure. And thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you all. Bye.